in this series called Overcoming Anxiety and uh, talking about the everyday anxieties we all face. And let me just be clear, uh, this series is about the, uh, the, the everyday anxieties because there is at times, and some of you in this room uh, may have be facing this, clinical levels of anxiety. And uh, this is kind of a different, uh, this is more of the everyday that we all face. Uh, although I will say this off the top, we do thank God for those who are clinicians and therapists and counselors. We believe that sometimes God heals supernaturally and sometimes God heals through a good clinician. Can we get an amen? amen. God heals through physicians and clinicians and therapists. We are a proponent of that here at Catalyst Church. Um, but in this series, we're really hoping to give you some practical uh, biblical instruction on how we can overcome the anxieties we face in life. And last week, Christina kicked it off uh, looking at the life of King Jehoshaphat and taking some principles of how he overcame anxiety we can apply to our own life. And today, I've entitled today's message, God's Blueprint for Battling Anxiety, because it is a battle. Uh, it is a, a battle, a war that we are all in. In fact, we're going to see in the scriptures Paul talks about when it comes to our mind, waging war. Um, and, and it is a battle that all of us face at some point or another uh, when it comes to our thought life. And, and last week, Christina kind of defined anxiety for us, but really sort of a refresher is what anxiety is. And by its definition, anxiety is a type of fear. Now, how fear, how it differs from other types of fear is anxiety is fear over what has not happened. So there's, there's many fears we can face, but anxiety is unique because we are fearing something that actually is not happening. So we're fearing the future. We're fearing what could happen. And I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. You know, in the scriptures, the Holy Bible, there are 366 scriptures that tell us to not fear. That's one for every day of the year plus a leap year. Come on. Amen. That that we see, the Bible says, perfect love cast out all fear. Amen. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear. Amen. Let me just say this way. So God has not given you a spirit of anxiety. And that his love casts out all anxiety. That's why Paul says in Philippians 4, to not be anxious about anything. You're like, that sounds real easy, Paul. Come on now. But, but anxiety is something that we, we all face, and I want to talk about from God's word, how can we, we overcome it? John 14, 27, Jesus said this. Um, he says, he says I'm, I'm leaving you with a gift. Let me also give context. This is towards the end of his, his life. This is, this is kind of part of his parting words. Um, he says, I'm leaving you with a gift, a peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give, the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. You can replace that word afraid with anxious. He says, I've given you a peace. So, so he has given us a gift of peace. But there are times in your life you may not be at peace. So we're going to talk about what are some scriptural, biblical tools on how we can regain the peace that Jesus has given us. Isaiah 26.3 speaks to it, and he says it this way. He says, you will keep in perfect peace, talking to God. All who trust in you, watch this, all whose thoughts are fixed on their problems. All whose thoughts are fixed on the economy. All whose thoughts are fixed on, it's almost quarter four, and I've hit none of my goals. Their goals are fixed on all the things that are happening this school year. No, what? Those whose thoughts are fixed on God. The God that we can actually have a perfect peace, Isaiah says. And we're going to talk through that today as we look to the scriptures. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. It is a holy and life-giving and transforming word. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you, you reveal truth to us and you make your word come alive and to change us so we would leave here differently than we came in. It's in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen. All right, point number one, if you're taking notes today, what's God's blueprint for battling anxiety? Point number one is we have to first reset our thinking. We have to reset our thinking. Proverbs 23, 7 tells us, 
For as a person thinks, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. That word heart, to clarify any confusion, refers to an inner person or our minds. Because how can you think in your heart? It's kind of an inner person. As we think, so we become, the proverb says. That our thoughts, I love how Craig Rochelle, Pastor Craig Rochelle put it. He said, our lives are moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. He wrote that in a book he wrote called Winning the War in Your Mind, a great book. That our, our lives are moving in the direction of our thoughts. And, our, and research actually shows this. And I can quote for the next 30 minutes numerous studies that have been done in various areas how they've shown our thought life or our beliefs influence the outcomes of our life. Uh, Carol Dweck did some groundbreaking research in the early 2000s on mindset. She wrote a book called Mindset. And what she's found is when controlling for other, other aspects of a student's life, that, what, that, that students who had what she calls a growth mindset, meaning if they believed their intelligence could improve, they performed significantly better in school than students who had a fixed mindset who believed their intelligence was stagnant. There was another research done in the Health Psychology Journal. You're going to love this one. They, they did a study between two different groups of people who had the same level of exercise. So let's say they, they ran 10 miles a week. Uh, any runners in the room? God bless you all. <laughs> you run for me. Thank you. Thank you. We all do our part. Uh, but so they, let's say they had two different groups that ran 10 miles a week. And watch this. The group that thought they had exercised enough to be healthy lived longer than those who believed they had not exercised enough. They measured, they, they, they controlled whether or not they had an illness, their weight, and their exercise levels. And the only difference they found was their thoughts. There was another study done where they, they actually had patients and they gave them the same like narcotic to relieve their pain. Those who believed that their pain was going to go away reported less pain than those who ruminated on their pain. <laughs> they, they found study after study, even when you eat food. Like if you think the food you're eating is going to fulfill you, you will be more full than if you think the food you're eating will not fulfill you. Like it's, it's like over and over, whether it's our health, it's our performance, your thoughts are directing your life. That it is, your thoughts are the seed to the fruit of your life over and over again. And I love when the research affirms what God's word says. As we think, so we are. So our life is. In fact, Paul said it this way in Romans 8, 6, to give you some New Testament. He says, a mind that's governed by the flesh, that's our natural self, is death. But a mind that's governed by the spirit is life and peace. So he says, when, when, our, when our thinking is just purely natural and, and, and based in just the reality that we see, then it will be death, anxiety, stress. But he says, a life that's governed by the Spirit, by the Word of God, is life and peace. The Scripture says God has given us the mind of Christ. That, 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 I want you to hear this. This isn't just self-help or pop psychology. This is the word of God. Come on, let's heed the words of Dr. Paul here. Come on, somebody. Yes. That, that, that our, our, our thoughts matter, and it is a spiritual battle as we're going to see. In fact, I love this because before I became a pastor, I was a psychologist who I worked predominantly with teenagers and adolescents. And one of the, 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 therapy, the therapies that I applied and by the way, if you have experienced any sort of therapy or counseling, you probably, the therapy you've received has probably been at least partially influenced by this therapeutic approach. It's called cognitive behavioral therapy. And uh, we have a graphic behind me, they'll show, the team will show, which kind of shows us um, sort of a, a, it's called the cognitive, cognitive triangle, if you like to geek out on this kind of stuff. Uh, it basically shows how our thoughts influence our emotions and influence our behaviors and vice versa. And here was the basic sort of approach of cognitive behavioral therapy that if you want to change, if you want to change a destructive emotion or a dysfunctional behavioral pattern in your life, then you need to change your faulty thought patterns. That it's your thoughts that's influencing, right? It's, it's so, so the anger you're expressing 
or the addiction you are experiencing or the overwhelming anxiety you're finding yourself in, its root, that fruit, its root is a thought in your life. That it's a narrative, it's a script that's running in your mind. So the whole premise was what we would, we would do, and I would, I would apply this, is that I would address like, hey, what, what, what is dysfunctional about your life that you want to change? Let's address the root, which is the thoughts. Again, this is biblical and this is practical. Let, let me give you a practical examples around how this can play out when it comes to anxiety. So let's say, for example, um, a new job opportunity comes up at work. And even though maybe you're even qualified for it, and there's a high likelihood you could get it. Let's say you have a narrative in your mind, a thought pattern, that says, there, if I apply for that job, I won't get that job. And that leads to anxiety or fear that if I applied, I'd get rejected. So then the consequence of the behavior is you don't apply for the job. Or let's say, come on, single fellas, you meet a girl. You notice her at Catalyst Church at the 1030 service. Trying to help you out. I'm just trying to help out. I'm here. I'm here to help. I'm here to help. And, and, and you see her and you, you find her attractive, but you think to yourself, there's no way a girl like her would date a guy like me. So you have anxiety that if I ask her out, she'll just say no. So you don't ask her out. Or, again, these are just examples of, of things that can come up. It is, is, let's say you, you, have a, you go to the doctor and you get a diagnosis of a disorder or uh, a chronic illness, and you think to yourself, and maybe you have fear that you'll always have this. There's no way I'll ever get relief from this. So the consequence is you stop praying for and believing for healing. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Watch this. How the enemy of your soul, Satan, can use anxiety is anxiety can actually stop you. Clini- clinicians call it flight or fight. But that's clinically. Spiritually, anxiety can prevent you from walking in your destiny. Because you are so crippled with anxiety, you won't launch the business because you're afraid of failure. You won't ask her out because you're afraid of rejection. You won't land that business deal because you're afraid of what won't happen. And today, we are going to war with anxiety in Jesus' name. Because God has a great destiny for your life. You believe it, can you say amen? amen? And listen, the way the enemy attacks is subtle come across like these anxious thoughts I just mentioned. Oh, I'm not going to launch that business. Some of you, I believe right now, you have dreams in your heart you've not stepped out on because of anxiety and fear over what might happen. And that's the way the enemy keeps you stuck. He keeps you frozen in anxiety and fear. So what do we have to do? Paul said this in Romans 12, We don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. But we let God transform us into a new person. Watch this. Not by praying more. Not by spending more time in worship. Not even by coming to church more often. What did he say? By changing the way you think. By changing how you think about things. Again, I want you to hear this. This isn't self-help pop psychology. This is spiritual. And, and we're, we're going to get to the end of the message to kind of give you a little bit of preview. We're not just going to say think positive thoughts, you know, think about rainbows and sunshine and peaches. Yeah. We're about the, I mean, although that's amazing. And pumpkin spice lattes. <laughs> we're going to think upon the powerful life transforming words of God that has the power to break off the bondage of anxiety on our lives. But we got to first understand, we got we to reset our thinking. We got to change the way we think. So then what we have to do is, point number two, is we have to protect our peace. So the scripture says, Jesus says, I've given you the gift of peace. So it's been given to us. But sometimes when life happens, we can lose our peace. So how do we protect our peace in the midst of life? Here's what Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart. Again, that word heart is the word inner person or mind. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. One translation says, for out of it flow flow the issues of life. That, That your life 
is, is flowing from, from your thoughts. So it says, guard it. Like you got to guard your mind. That word guard actually in the Hebrew, it actually, the, the word picture, it's like a prison guard. Like armed, like guarding a prison. You need to guard your mind. Well, 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 well pastor, what do I got to guard my mind from? Let me give you a few practicals. We have to guard our minds from the media we're consuming. Because the media we're consuming, listen, just like physical nutrition, listen, what you, what you take in affects your physical health. What you're taking in mentally is affecting your mental health. Amen. Now, I'm not, this isn't a message that's like down on certain media. I'm not saying like cancel Netflix and withdraw from social media and become a hermit. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is be mindful. Be mindful of how media is influencing you. I remember... Um, a few years ago, anybody ever heard of the Nextdoor app? Nextdoor, it's like a neighborhood app. Um, and uh, I think they should call that app the fear-provoking app. Um, <laughs> like when you go on that app, literally every other post is like, there's dangerous men walking in my street. You know what I'm talking about? Like every other post. It's like I was walking my dog last night and I saw a coyote. It's, it's like this is a little bit too much. Like if you look at that app too long, you'd be afraid of everything. It's like, slow down there, Karen, okay? <laughs> slow down. If your name's Karen, we love you. We love you, Karen. Take that out of the online. Take that out of the online. Hey, listen, listen, listen. So... I was on there one night, and, and there was like this post. It was like there's these young, young boys breaking into cars. And they had like, you know, it gets like real fear-provoking when they got like the, like, you know, the videos? Yeah. Like my ring camera got them. Yeah. It's like, well, shoot, man, I need to. So, so wisdom says, because they were just breaking into cars that were unlocked. So the wisdom says, Jeremy, lock your cars. But anxiety says, every sound you hear might be someone breaking in your car. So one night, it's like 2 a.m., I hear a sound. So what does anxiety tell me to do? You better check outside. Your car could be getting broken into right now. Was my car ever broken into? No. But do you see what anxiety does? Is it, is it, is it again, it's, it's, it's trying to... to to bring dysfunction and destruction. What does Paul say? The mind governed by the flesh is death. So again, I'm not saying don't go on Nextdoor app. Although if you do work for Nextdoor, please change some of the dynamics of that app. <laughs> Be a little more positive. Um, um, but I'm saying is be mindful. You know, there have been numerous studies done. I read one this week by Stanford University. They've actually found a correlation between um, time spent on social media and reports of, clinic, of, of levels of anxiety. You, we gotta guard ourselves when we're, when we're engaging in media. And can I say this for the parents in the room? We have to be the guardian for our children because they don't know how to guard their own mind. There's a book, it's a, it's, I'm not, this isn't a formal endorsement, it's not a Christian book. It's called The Anxious Generation. As a parent, I'd recommend you read that. And they have shown, it's, it's actually pretty alarming. Since the advent of the smartphone and social media, anxiety levels and depression levels in children and adolescents has skyrocketed. And they directly point it to children's use on technology. And listen, you be, be prayerful. I would say that. I'm not going to tell you how to, but be prayerful. They do have some pretty strong recommendations on whether or not your child should have a device in their hands and when they should have social media. But I do think as a parent, it's just guard your child for their sake. Um, because the enemy is um, attacking the next generation. That's why we're a church for the next generation. We are passionate about the next generation. Um, because we're going to say, enemy, not, not on our watch. And... Um, and, and be mindful of the technology, uh, how it's affecting your child's developmental brain. And, and it's, um, but be, be guardians. Sometimes too, you have to guard your mind from the environments and the people you're around. Have you ever been around some people when like you're around them and you leave their presence, you're like, I feel more anxious. 
Like, and again, I'm not saying don't go to Thanksgiving at your family's house. Come on, somebody. <laughs> no, but in all sincerity, it doesn't mean that you like cut them out of your life. You're just mindful. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm in the presence of these certain people that might not realize how anxious they are. And I need to guard my own mind so I don't find myself gripped with the same fear that they're gripped with. Um, and, and then, you know, it's being mindful of the thoughts that are coming in and out of our minds. You know, I, I love what Dr. Caroline Leaf, she's a, she's a Christian neuroscientist. She's written several great books. She says this, she says, God designed humans to observe our own thoughts, catch those that are bad, and get rid of them. She essentially says in a very plain way what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 10. He says this, verse 3, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and destroy false arguments, the lies of the enemy. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God, and we capture their rebellious thoughts and we teach them to obey Christ. So Paul says we wage a war, and the war is in our mind. He says we demolish every proud obstacle, every thought that's coming against the truth of the word of God. He's using an aggressive language here when it comes to our thoughts. So Paul's saying this, we don't just let thoughts come in and out of our mind. We take them captive. It reminded me several years ago, I was in South Carolina, and I was in what they call kind of low country, and it was around water. It's like an area in South Carolina where they have like, like, like bugs that we don't have here in the D.C. area. Come on. They're like mutants. They're like the size of a fist. So all around this deck, they had these like, like, like bu- I call them bug zappers. I don't know what else to call them. You know what I'm like the bug, it's like the, the, the lights and the bugs come in and as they come to the light, they get zapped. If you love bugs, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Um, I, I actually have one here with me today. Um, it's, uh, it's not on, so don't worry. Um, but it was like this. And, and, and you know, they, they come in and every few moments we would hear that like, And uh, watch this, like, so, so the, the bugs, they, they go in, come on, they're taken captive by this light, which has some electricity. And these pests, what it did was it prevented these pests from biting people. Amen. Here's what Paul says, listen, there will be thoughts that come into your mind and you not, may not be able to control every thought that crosses your mind. But you can take it captive. And you can make it obedient to Christ. And you can destroy, as he says, every false argument, every stronghold, every lie of the enemy. You can destroy and make it obedient to Christ. So I love it because Paul says to take every thought captive. He says, take it captive. Be, be proactive. And let, let me give you a practical way to do this. So say tomorrow morning you get up. Maybe even tonight. Come on. Maybe you have the Sunday scaries. Come on, somebody. And the anxiety starts to pick up because tomorrow morning, uh, <laughs> you know that meeting you got to walk into. Or come on, parents. You know you got to get your kids ready for school after a weekend at home. Anybody else, your kids, like, they don't want to wake up on Monday. It's like, they're like, Is it, can it still be weekend? Um, and and, and the, that anxiety starts to pick up over that meeting, over maybe you got a doctor's appointment this week. Maybe for you, your anxiety kicks in in the middle of the night. It's 3 a.m. in the morning, and you're up, and your mind's racing. It's all the what ifs and what ifs and what ifs. And what. In those moments where you feel anxiety, either in the moment or, or sometime after, Write down, take captive, write down whatever script is running through your mind while you're anxious. You know, they have actually found clinically in research, just by merely writing your anxious thoughts lowers your levels of anxiety. What are they, they're, they're, taking, they're applying what Paul said, take captive every thought. Now, I actually did this personally this week. I've, I wrote down every thought I've had that's kind of caused anxiety. And it's amazing the power it will have when you bring it to light. 
And you see too, like, wow, how untrue that is. When you actually see the thought that's causing the anxiety and the fear in your life. But then you don't leave it there. You don't just write it down. You replace it with a powerful truth. And that's point three. So we've reset our thinking. We've, we've, we're protecting our peace. We're guarding our mind. And then third is, is we then focus on God and his truth. And this is where the power is. So these first steps have been getting us to this point. This is where the power is, Paul says. It's the power to destroy the lies, the falsehoods. I love Joshua 1, verse 8. This is God speaking to Joshua. And let me give you context. Joshua had just taken over leadership of the Israelite army after Moses. Moses was a beloved leader. Joshua's young. There's natural anxiety. Like for all of us, when you start a new job, there's natural anxiety, right? Or you, you start something new, maybe you're a new parent, there's natural anxiety. So Joshua had these like probably natural anxieties of like I'm leading the, the Israelites now. And here's what, what God tells him. Study this book of instruction, the word of God, continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. So he says, I want you to to study the book. He He says, I want you to meditate on it day and night. That word meditate means to to ruminate, to think over and over again. So watch this. Here's the power of what's happening. A lot of times with anxiety and anxious thoughts, we end up ruminating on things that lead to anxiety. We think about all the bad things that might happen in that meeting tomorrow. We think of all the things. When you get that email from that, your child's, parent, your child's teacher, uh, Mr. So-and-so, can we meet tomorrow? All of us, each other's ruminating, right? Oh, what's going to happen? And, and he's saying, I want you to ruminate. I want you to think over and over again on the truth of the word of God. A good word picture for this is, is cows chewing their cud. If you know a cow, when they eat grass, they chew it up. They, they swallow it. They regurgitate it. They chew it again. They swallow it. They regurgitate it. They chew it again. Well, I didn't realize. I just thought cows were disgusting. Come on. <laughs> but I do love steak. So do your thing, cow. Um, so... Um, but, but the reason they do that is, is um, I, I read this this week, I, I never knew this, that by regurgitating and chewing again, they're squeezing every ounce of nutrition out of it. So they regurgitate and they chew it again, they're getting more minerals and vitamins out of it. So God's saying, I want you to meditate on my word to get every ounce of life and peace that's out of the word. A few years ago, Christine and I were, were going out on a date night, and we, my, my youngest at the time was two years old, and she was having a little hard time letting mom and dad go out, and I remember, I'll, I'll start this day, she was, she was on the, the steps of our house, and she was sitting there and, and was kind of like, you could tell she was not, not, uh, not happy, she didn't want mom and dad to leave, and then all of a sudden, she starts singing a song. And she starts singing a song from Daniel Tiger. Anybody seen Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood cartoon? All three of my kids watched it. It's basically Mr. Rogers in cartoon format. So she starts singing. They have catchy songs. Like when you got to go potty, stop and go right away. Like that's a good truth, right? Apply that to your life. If you got to go potty, stop. And then wash your hands, it says. So it's really good. It's good life lessons, right? Um... (laughs) <laughs> but then this one she was singing was, was actually an episode about mom and dad going away. And the song was, grown-ups come back. Grown-ups come back to you. Grown-ups come back to you. Grown-ups come back. And she started singing it. What was she doing? She was meditating on a, tr- on a truth that, that mom and dad are going to come back. They're going to go on a date. They're going to come on back. 
Um, and let me also say this, the difference between what, what is culture known as Eastern meditation and biblical meditation is meditation is not about emptying your mind. It's about filling your mind with truth. It's a difference. And, and, and she, was, she was thinking on this truth that mom and dad are going to come back, and it helped ease her anxiety about mom and dad going away. So let me give you some practicals on how you can meditate on God's word. I got three simple ways you can meditate this week. Number one is you can write out the word of God. Write it. There is, there is incredible power to when you read scripture. This is why I encourage you to take notes in church. Not so you record what I say, so you record what God says. Because there is power in writing out the truth of the word of God. It's writing it out. Also, then to think on it. That's number two. Think about it. So when you read the word of God, so, so let me give you an example again on, on Sunday morning. You take notes. I know all of you take copious notes at church. And um, I mean, at least if you want a mansion in heaven. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I just want you to take notes. Um, no, but, but so you, you take notes on Sunday but then you review them on Monday. What are you doing? You're thinking on it. You didn't just hear it once and moved on. You're, you're th- Let's say tomorrow morning, you read, you read, by the way, on your seats when you came in, you had the lamp and light Bible reading plan. You know, you're reading through your, your daily scripture. As you don't just read it once, but you read it again. And, and you think about it. And, and you, you kind of meditate on it. And then third is you confess it. You speak it. You you. As what Abby did, she was singing it. Uh, you can sing it if you'd like. Uh, but, but there's something powerful when you declare the word of God, when you declare Romans 8, 28, and my God is working all things together for my good according to his will. That when, you, when, you, when you speak out Ephesians 3, 20, hey, parents, too, there's power when you speak out the word of God over your children's lives. Like when you speak out, man, and God will do exceedingly and abundantly and above more than we can ever ask, think, or imagine, Ephesians 3.20, Galatians 6, 9, that, 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 that we will reap a harvest in due time as we keep doing good. When you declare the word of God, it's got power in your life. You're, you're, you're getting the word on the inside of you, that we're storing it up in our heart. We're, we're meditating on the word of God. Let me give you a couple practical truths Maybe this will, this will speak to some of you, some anxious, some common anxious thoughts you might have. Maybe for you, an anxious thought you, you battle with is that things are going to get worse. Maybe things at work aren't going, going well, and you think to yourself, they're going to get worse. Maybe your child's struggling so far at school this year, and you think things are going to get worse. But here's a truth that you can meditate upon to, to break the power of that thought. And that is Romans eight twenty eight. This is a summation of it, that all things are working together for my good. Maybe your thought is, every time you open up your bank account or you do your budget, you fear, you have anxiety, I'm not going to have enough. Well, here's a, here's a scripture for you, Philippians 4.19. God will supply all of my needs according to his riches in Christ. Or maybe for you, you you're battling a health condition, and, or maybe a loved one is, and you think they're going to get worse. They're going to get more sick. It's going to get worse. Psalms 103.3 reminds us, God heals all our diseases. You can begin to meditate upon these powerful truths. So in every area you feel anxiety, like if it's over finances, look up all of the scriptures about how God provides. If it's in the area of sickness, look up all the scriptures about how God's a healer. Like, look up and renew your mind, reset your thinking, focusing on the truth of the Word of God. Even if you, you don't know where to look, just look up all the, the scriptures that tell you not to fear and to tell you, tell you about the peace of God. There's so many of them that we can reset our thinking and experience the power of the Word of God. Philippians 4, Paul said this in verse 8. So Philippians 4, 6, it says, do not be anxious over anything. Verse 8, he then says, fix your thoughts on what is true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise and keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Paul says, be intentional about what you think about. 
Be intentional about your thoughts. Don't let your thoughts just kind of wander. Like, be intentional. Renew your mind. Focus. Can I tell you, during periods of high anxiety, one of the best things you can do is you can have, the Bible calls the scripture the sword of the spirit, is you have these scriptures that you wield and that you think on and you write out and you speak and you declare and you sing and you remind yourself of who God is and you fight fear with faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and can I tell you anxiety is no match for our faith but you got to feed it It doesn't just happen Paul says you got to be intentional about it you got to think about it I commend you. You're in the house of God today. You got to come to the house of God in Senator teaching. You got to read the scriptures. You got to think on the scriptures. You got to declare the scriptures over your life. Let, let me give you three ways you can be intentional. I'm going to close with this. Three ways to be intentional about your thoughts. Write these down. This, is, this, is, this will help. Number one is remember what God has done. Psalm 77 11, the psalmist says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I remember your miracles long ago. Remember, so why, this is powerful practice. If you're battling anxiety about something coming up, is take a moment, pull out a journal, and write down all the prayers God's answered in the past. Write down all the ways God's been good in your past. How he saw you through that hard season at work. How he saw you when you lost your grandmother. How all the times he's been faithful to you. Number two is remember what God's promised. That's the word of God. Psalms 56, three. The psalmist says, when I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. I praise God for what he has promised. I love this. I trust God, so why should I be afraid? God, thank you for what you're promised. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. You do have the words of life and peace. I'm gonna stand on the promises of God. And then lastly is remember, this is, what, this is what God told Joshua, remember that God's with you. He told Joshua in verse 9, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Hey, he's with you tomorrow in that meeting at work. He's with you at that doctor's appointment this week. He's with you as you have that difficult conversation. He's with you in your financial anxiety right now. God is with you. Three years ago, I had a moment where I, I had to battle anxiety. It was uh, spring of 2021. We were coming back to regather as a church after the pandemic. And I had anxiety about whether or not, we were a young church. We were 13 months old when the pandemic happened. So I didn't know, would we make it? Would we survive? Many churches our age did not that I know of. And I thought, man, well, well like we even survive this. When we were coming back, and I don't know if you remember the pandemic at like 2020, 2021. Maybe some of you are like, no, I erased it from my memory. Um, but, you know, there was a narrative of like, people may never regather in church again. Like, remember when people, they used to say we would never go back to restaurants? Come on. Like, that was like a narrative. Like, we might just live at home the rest of our life. And I'm like, well, man, I don't know if people are going to come back to church. So I had some anxiety about, man, God, are we going to even, like, if we come back on Easter, will anybody be there? Um, but I applied this scripture. I remembered what God had done. And I remembered when we planted the church, um, a church planter's number one fear when they plant a church is when they start their church, the only people there will be his family. Come on, somebody. I knew my mom would be there. Love you, mama. I was like, I'd be anybody else. We here, Lord. Um, and I, but I remembered how God was faithful in our first 13 months. And I remember what he had promised in 2017. He had promised us in prayer that he was going to establish a church here in Bethesda. Not Jeremy and Christina, he was going to. I said, God, you said you were going to do that, so you're going to do it. And then I remember he was with me. We were in 21 days of prayer. So I made it a matter of prayer. I, I began to cast my anxieties upon the Lord. And can I tell you now, three and a half years later, 
You know, our church since that moment has grown over three times the size. Hundreds of people have come to faith in Christ. How many know God is faithful to what he has promised, church? And I don't know what kind of anxiety you're facing right now, but I know that our God is greater than any fear or anxiety you are facing right now. And he wants to give you the gift of peace. And he's given us a blueprint to battle the anxieties of life. Let me pray for you this morning. You can bow your heads right where you are.